Okay, so we're going to be looking at solving the ordinary differential equation dy by dx is equal to 7x minus 3y minus 7 all over 7y minus 3x plus 3. Now this differential equation is not homogeneous, but it can be reduced to homogeneous form. To do that, we introduce a capital X and a capital Y, such that capital X is x plus x naught, capital Y is y plus y naught, where x naught and y naught values we're going to work out later. This means that little x is capital X minus x naught, little y is capital Y minus y naught. So our goal is now to construct a differential equation in terms of these new variables, capital X and capital Y, instead of the little x and little y, the equation we were given. First of all, let's notice that since capital X is equal to little x plus x naught, if you differentiate both sides with respect to little x, you get that d capital X by d little x is equal to 1. In other words, d capital X is the same as d little x. The same thing is true for the y's. This means that dy by dx is the same as d capital Y by d capital X. So that's the left hand side of the differential equation we were given. Let's take a look at the right hand side and try and express that in terms of capital X and capital Y's. To do this, all we have to do is replace the little x's and the little y's by capital X minus x naught and capital Y minus y naught, respectively. We then multiply out these brackets. We see that if we can choose these terms that are now circled in red to be zero, then the equation we end up with is homogeneous form. So this means we need to try and work out values for x naught and for y naught, so that minus 7 times x naught plus 3 times y naught minus 7 is 0, and also that 3 times x naught minus 7 times y naught plus 3 is 0. What we've got here is a pair of simultaneous equations, and we can solve them using the usual methods. So for example, let's multiply the top equation by 3, multiply the bottom equation by 7, and then if we do that and add the equations together, the x noughts will then cancel. And that leaves us with minus 40 times y naught is 0, in other words, y naught must be 0. So let's take our value for y naught, substitute it back into one of those equations, um, for example, the second of those, and we see that x naught has got to be equal to minus 1. So this means we've managed to reduce the differential equation we were given to the following. d capital y by d capital x is equal to 7 times capital X minus 3 times capital Y, all over 7 times capital Y minus 3 times capital X. And what we've got here now is a homogeneous equation. So to solve this, we introduce a new variable z to be equal to y over x. This, of course, can be rearranged if y is equal to x times z. And then dy by dx is the derivative with respect to x of z times x. Well, we can work out this derivative by applying the product rule of differentiation. And we see that it is x times dz by dx plus z. The right-hand side of our transformed equation can also be written in terms of x's and z's. Notice that we place the y by the x times z, and so what we end up with on top is 7 times x minus 3 times x times z, while on the bottom is 7 times x times z minus 3 times x. Crucially, there's a common factor of x here that can cancel top and bottom, leaving us with 7 minus 3z all over 7z minus 3. So we've been able to transform now our reduced equation to the following. x times dz over x plus z is equal to 7 minus 3z over 7z minus 3. So now let's go about solving this equation using separation of variables. So first of all, we pull the z over onto the right-hand side. And then we express the right-hand side as a single fraction. If we do this, multiply the brackets, we see that the right-hand side is nothing more than 7 minus 7z squared all over 7z minus 3. We now have a separable differential equation, and we shall go about solving this in the usual way. So I've got to bring the 7z minus 3 from the bottom of the right-hand side up to the top of the left-hand side. We're going to take the 7 minus 7z squared, and I'm going to bring that to the bottom of the left-hand side. Well, actually, I'm going to leave the 7 on the right-hand side and just pull down a factor of 1 minus z squared to the left-hand side. We'll also take our x from the left-hand side, move it over to the right-hand side, and also the same with dx. So when we do this, we end up with the integral of 7z minus 3 over 1 plus z squared 
integrated with respect to z is equal to the integral with respect to x of 7 over x. Now this left hand integral can be calculated by using a method of partial fractions. Notice that the integral is nothing more than 7z minus 3 over 1 minus z times 1 plus z. Well, the partial fraction form of this is a constant a over 1 minus z plus a constant b over 1 plus z. And because we've got single linear factors, these constants a and b can be worked out very easily using the cover-up rule. So let's work out what a constant a is equal to. Well, a is the term whose denominator is 1 minus z. So the denominator is 0 when z is equal to 1. So we cover up the factor 1 minus z on the left hand side, replace z by the value 1, and we see we end up with a 7 minus 3 on top and a 1 plus 1 on the bottom. Well that's a 4 on top, a 2 on the bottom, and that's of course equivalent to 2. Therefore a constant a must be equal to 2. Similarly, um, b is the term that involves the denominator 1 plus z. Well 1 plus z is 0 when z is equal to minus 1, so we cover up the factor 1 plus z replace z by the value of minus 1 in everything that's left and we see that we end up with minus 10 divided by 2 well that gives us minus 5 so b must be minus 5. So let's take this partial fraction form of the integrand of the left hand side and throw it into our integral and we have now some terms that we can integrate, um, integrate separately. So the first integral of the left hand side is minus 2 times the natural logarithm of 1 minus z Notice a minus sign arises because the integrand itself is a 1, sorry, the integrand is over a 1 minus z, and the minus sign in front of a z uh, uh, becomes a minus sign outside the logarithm. That basically follows because of um, using a substitution. So we have minus 2 times log of the absolute value of 1 minus z, minus 5 times the natural logarithm of the absolute value of 1 plus z is equal to 7 times the natural logarithm of the absolute value of x, plus a constant of integration c. So if we now go ahead and use the laws of logarithms, all the coefficients, sorry, all the constants that pre-multiply the logarithms come up to and act as powers. And we can now simplify this expression by taking exponentials of both sides. So we end up with 1 minus z to the power of minus 2, multiplied by the absolute value of 1 plus z to the power of minus 5, is equal to a constant a times the absolute value of x to the power 7. And this constant a is equal to the exponential of c, where c was our previous constant of integration. The point being that if c is a constant, then the exponential of a constant must also be a constant. Well, at this point, let's remember that z is equal to y divided by x. <coughs> so we're going to substitute in for z to be y over x. And when we do this, we end up with terms involving 1 minus y over x and 1 plus y over x. Well, we can write the 1s here as x over x's. And that means each of these terms on the left-hand side can be written as single fractions. So we have x minus y over x, all to the power of minus 2, multiplied by the absolute value of x plus y all over x to the power of minus 5, is equal to a constant a times the absolute value of x to the power 7. Now let's remember that if you take a term and raise it to a negative power, that simply means the reciprocal of that term raised to a positive equivalent of that power. When we do this, we see that on the left-hand side, we have the absolute value of x to the power of 7. And that cancels with the absolute value of x to the power of 7 on the right-hand side. So if we rearrange this equation, cancelling those x to the 7s, we see that x minus y squared multiplied by the absolute value of x plus y to the power of minus, sorry, absolute value of x plus 5 to the power of 5 must equal a constant a prime. Where this a prime is actually 1 over the a from earlier. Now we have to remember that capital X and capital Y represented little x plus x naught and little y plus y naught, where x naught was minus 1 and y naught was 0. So let's substitute in for capital X and capital Y to get our general solution being that X minus Y minus 1 squared times the absolute value of X plus Y minus 1 to the power of 5 is equal to a constant A prime. You'll notice we've dropped the absolute value surrounding the X minus Y minus 1 squared term and that's because if you square a number you always end up with a positive value or at least a non-negative value.